Hey guys, this is Ben from Road to VR, and I'm here with Julian from Trinity VR. And uh, I just got to check out the Trinity Magnum, which they just launched on Kickstarter the other day. And I'm here to learn a little bit more about it. So can you give us kind of the, the elevator pitch for now? What, what makes your product different, and why is there room for it among the other tracking solutions? Um, so one of the things we noticed when we started uh, to look at what are the other input solutions for VR, um, we found that you know, they can be a little bit of a hassle. Um, lots of calibration, wire straps. Uh, if you just want to get into the game and kind of pick up and play, you know, there wasn't anything that met our needs, nor was there something that was affordable. You know, most of these things are over $300. I mean, we just want to say, if, if we're paying $300 for a headset and investing a lot of overhead in, in, expensive, in expensive PC hardware, um, you know, what's, what's the kind of the lowest barrier to entry? And, you know, the Trinity Magnum was kind of the product that covered the most use cases at the lowest cost. And what is that cost for people un unaware? Uh, sub $100, so uh, the early, early burn on the developer kit is $80 through Kickstarter, and then it's uh, 99 after that. And how long have you guys uh, been building up to this Kickstarter? When did development start? So we started building up to the Kickstarter about six months ago. Um, actually, January 1st, 2014 is when we kind of, we got together I, with the other developers, Zach and Jeff, um, Chief of Hardware and Chief of Software, respectively, and what we noticed was we were trying to play, you know, these VR-enabled games, Half-Life 2, Team Fortress 2, and, you know, we're still using a mouse and keyboard fumbling around, and, uh, you know, we kind of, you had the game view unlocked from the gun view, but you still didn't have that one-to-one -one tracking. So, you know, the Trinity Magnum was kind of the solution to that problem in light of there not really being anything else out there. You know, there was the Razer Hydra, which was um, discontinued, and then the STEM, but, um, you know, we, we still felt that there was a room for something more specific that fit that use case better quality. And what has been the response from uh, people that you've had experienced the prototype so far? Uh, very positive experience uh, for most people. Uh, you know, the tracking, the positional, it really adds a lot. It adds to that immersion. And, uh, you know, one of the things we actually tested on was, you know, older people or, or people who are outside of kind of the traditional gaming demographic. And I think that's one of the real promises of virtual reality is it can be one of the most accessible um, computing platforms today. I mean, we saw that happen with the iPad and mobile. Um, the touchscreen enabled people to kind of break down some of those traditional metaphors and really just kind of get into it. So we tested on my grandmother, grandparents, and, you know, they were shooting targets and playing a first-person shooter within, with little to no explanation. So that's pretty exciting for the platform and for the promise of VR. Yeah, that's a, a very, I think, interesting thing about this natural input where you don't need to know, you don't need to be familiar with how games work, you just need to be familiar with how, you know, you normally move, uh, that's, right. and the natural input just makes it really intuitive. Um, so tell me a little bit about the games that you guys are hoping to support at this point. Uh, so the first one we're kind of officially supporting is uh, Zone by Pixel Router, formerly Rift Wars, and it's a cool kind of hybrid between Star Fox and Geometry Wars, and it's just a lot of fun, and you kind of control the gun turret through, um, it's very arcade style, you control the gun turret through the Trinity Magnum and uh, really adds a lot to the experience and just feeling like you're in the cockpit of that ship and, um, you know, just very pick up and play action in VR. And, and that's kind of something, uh, again, you know, translating your one-to-one -one real world skills into the virtual environment is something we're, we're trying to encourage. And uh, it, I think that's, that's, you know, the kind of idea of the VR Cade is also very exciting. And, you know, those are the type of titles we're going after, those quick pick up and play experiences that you can just really get a lot of gratification from that require a low uh, learning curve. And I think that's why the Magnum with kind of its minimal input and I, it's a great device for that. Now, the PlayStation uh, Move works on a similar principle, but you guys have developed this specifically for, you know, a kind of a gun holding scenario. Right. Do you think that might be a little bit too specific? Um, or do you ever see a, a point where you'd want to branch out and be able to have those two hands instead of a, a gun prop? Right. So, you know, the Magnum is designed right now in, in its newest iteration to be held either mono grip or dual grip. Um, mono grip is with one hand, so we can track two devices at the same time, and you could use both and wield both. Um, we do have plans for other form factors for the product, but you know sometimes you need the right tool for the right job, and in, in VR it's all about immersion. Anything that kind of breaks that is really detracting from the experience. So you know really holding the object with two hands gives you that precision, that an aiming, and that's what you really want in a first-person shooter game. And you don't want to grip it with one hand; you want to hold it with two. So you know that's something that you know should have a specific. Mm -hmm. Form so regarding uh, the precision, so that is obviously very important for a first-person game. 
Right. What, what kind of performance threshold are you guys aiming for? Yeah, so in terms of positional, um, you know, we're sub like five millimeter right now. And that's completely dependent on the quality of the webcam. You know, uh, it has to do with the resolution of the webcam, how far back you're sitting. Um, you know, a lot of variables affect that. So the higher resolution camera you have, and you know, because we're based on open source camera technologies, um, you know, we support those newer devices that come out. Um, it also has size to do with the, you know, the sphere. So you know, as time goes on, we can actually keep making that sphere smaller and smaller because the camera resolution increases. So you know, that's, it's a function of that. That's why the design is. And um, so I want to be a little bit honest here and say I've been following the augmented reality world you know, yeah. as much as I have the virtual reality world. Um, right. And a lot of it revolves around computer vision, which just doesn't feel like a solved problem yet. It's obviously really important for your product. Um, how confident are you that you can get to that 99.9% you know, .9 solid algorithm that doesn't frustrate people? Yeah, so I mean, we still have time before consumer VR hits, before, before you know, consumer AR really hits. Um, and those are the problems we're working through with the development community. And you, by kind of offloading some of that problem to the open source community through using OpenCV, we can grow with them. And, you know, we believe in this technology. We believe in computer vision. And, I, you know, it's a scalable technology. It's, you know, we're not dependent on the hardware to get better. Our platform grows and scales with the software. So, you know, the promise of that is that today it can be one thing, but in, in two years it can be a completely other thing. And, um, that's by virtue of the fact that we're on a fluid kind of foundation through software. So we've got the prototype here. Is this, this is your original? Can you tell me a little bit about, about putting this together and, and kind of how old it is or when it was made? Yeah, so this prototype is about four months old, and it's been to every conference for the past three months. Um, and it's held together, and that's, that's why we still use it. Um, one of the things we did was uh, I was based in New York City and I was working on kind of the mechanical design and, you know, the, the whole housing for the device and working with Zach and Jeff. Jeff was the chief of hardware. He kind of built all the um, components on the inside, um, uh, PCB layout, and, you know, we were based on the Arduino platform initially, and that's really what allowed us to, to, to kind of uh, get our wings. And then Zach worked on the positional tracking, so we, we were kind of based... Uh, remotely in three different locations. We brought it all together. I sent the 3D print to Mountain View. Jeff picked up the casing, and we put it together the night of GDC, the night before GDC, and uh, everything worked, so. Cool, yeah, so I actually ended up seeing it at GDC kind of when you guys were still under the radar, and at the time you were using just a blue ball in the end that, that wasn't lit up. Can you talk a, a little bit about Talk about uh, how this works, and then we'll talk about the current prototype. Sure. So initially, actually, um, we were using the Connect to do the positional tracking, and uh, we were using depth maps. And um, you know, we found that it did gave good results, but it was an expensive piece of hardware uh, that not everybody owned. So we transitioned then to light tracking through RGB, and uh, you know, we, we then were able to leverage the OpenCV um, software library, which you know, a lot of our core functions and algorithms come from. And so now you're using the, the glowing ball, and can we look here at the, uh, the next prototype? Yeah. And so this one will have, this is just fully 3D printed at, for the time right. being. This was just 3D printed um, from our uh, design partner, Cinder Solutions. They did the ergonomics, focusing on uh, doing studies with uh, groups. And, you know, this is kind of the, the form factor we came up with, which was something that was kind of, um, you know, it really just, ha it was all designed for comfort. And in VR, you have no concept of, you know, what this object looks like. So, th I mean, that's less relevant. What's more relevant is how does it feel? And, um, you know, how is it designed in a way where it can be used for other applications? Can it feel, can you suspend your disbelief in VR to believe it's something else? So, you know, we tried to choose a form factor that was, specific enough to the first person shooter problem, but also not limiting to, to other use cases. So the product will support any camera that's compatible with OpenCV and it'll scale according to how good that camera is. Right. Um, you guys are also trying to, or you, you know, it's a goal to implement with the Oculus Rift DK2 IR camera. Is that something right. that you think can be done? Uh, it, we've run it by our design partner and they've said it should be very doable. You know, it's just, uh, and I have also talked to a contact through Oculus who's working on their computer vision, gave them our requirements and they said it should have everything we need. So we plan on supporting it. Um, if we need to um, 
support it through having an interchangeable kind of light tracking solution on the end. You know, uh, we will, um, but we can support both IR and, and RGB solutions. And so, if your Kickstarter performs as as planned, what is the uh, what's the next step? Uh, so the next step is just to continue to, um, you know, get dev kits in the hand of developers. Uh, we're really trying to make it as frictionless an integration as possible. Um, you know, with our SDK, uh, we're, we're looking to just release that to the community before the hardware even gets out and, uh, you know, have you emulate it through an Xbox controller just so you can start playing with it and, and seeing what tools are at your disposal. And when are you uh, hoping to get those shipped out to developers? Uh, by the end of the year. And then following that, uh, you're interested in putting out a consumer product? Uh, yeah, and you know, kind of the critical path to our consumer product is, you know, very much dependent on the state of consumer M HMDs that are available, whether that's led by Oculus or some other HMD manufacturer. You know, that's that remains to be seen, but that's kind of what we're waiting for. And there's really no reason for us to rush to the consumer market before that. There's that good bed of content and, and HMD support. And outside of the virtual reality world, do you see anywhere where this might fit, uh, even if just in a small niche or fun place? Sure. I mean, I think motion controls are absolutely um, usable across many different applications, whether that be robotics or, you know, an arcade even. Um, you know, it's a device that, it's an input platform. And while we're kind of saying it's for virtual reality, there's no reason you have to use it just for um, virtual reality. It, it can be integrated with C++ bindings or, um, you know, in a, a game engine. So you could even use it just as a controller should you really want to. Great. Well, I want to thank you so much for taking the time. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Ben.